Hi, everybody. This is Patty Negri. Welcome to the Witching Hour. Yes, that hour of the day when the veil is thin and magic happens. I have some very special magic for you today. I have adventurer, author, podcaster, and storyteller, Jeff Belanger. You might know him from all sorts of things. He is an award-winning author, head writer for Ghost Adventures television series, Emmy-nominated host, writer, and producer of New England Legends, and he founded Ghost Village, one of the first paranormal sites on the internet, with so many to follow. So welcome, Jeff. Thanks for coming on. Hey, Patty. Good to see you again. Great to see you. It's been a whole week or something like that, week and a half. (laughs) That's been about it, yeah. Um, yeah, since um, Michigan Paragon, we were both there together, um, up way up, 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 upper Michigan, with yeah, lots of little UP. planes to get there. The yeah, UP. The UP, the, UP, the Upper the UP, Peninsula. Yeah. Upper Peninsula, in the middle of nowhere. I, I as a rule, don't know where I am most weeks, most days on, on travel, because I kind of skipped those classes in geography, but I really had no idea where we were there. When they wanted to, to get off the plane, I would have never got there. <laughs> yeah, no, that's it's a uh, it's um, an amazing place, uh, the Upper Peninsula. It's um, y- you know, what's funny is they they call people from the Upper Peninsula Upers, UP Uppers, Upers. you know, Upers, and um, and they're right on the border with Canada. You're literally a river away from being in Canada, and uh, they call people that live below the the Mackinac Bridge, which is the main part of Michigan that everybody knows. Uh, they call those people people who live below the bridge. They call them trolls. So if you want to talk like a local. You've got youpers yeah. and trolls. Do the trolls embrace the troll name or not so much? Probably not. I think that's a one way sort of thing. Like one way sort they, of thing. The they may have their trolls. Yeah. They may have their own uh thing. Yeah. Um we met originally via uh, on the phone, I think, from Ghost Adventures. And what I just learned too is I know that you are the head writer and researcher for Ghost Adventures, but then you've done every single one. All of them. That since is kind ep- of huge. Yeah, since episode one. Yeah, no, and and some of the spinoff shows like Aftershocks and Paranormal Challenge and um, all of that. Yeah, it's it's hundreds and hundreds of episodes that we've worked on now. It's fun. It was supposed to just be eight episodes. Um, Zach, <laughs> Zach called me way back in 2008. And at that point, they had just done the documentary that aired on Sci-Fi. I, I didn't work on that. That was That was before me. And he said, hey, we just got a series on the Travel Channel. It's going to be eight episodes. That's it. And we need someone, you know, you, you've written books about haunted places all over. You've got your website. You've, this is what you do. Uh, and I thought, well, that'll be fun. I've never worked in the medium of television. So I've done this for everything else. And so it was uh, eight episodes. And I helped find the locations and all the people that come on and share their stories and all the historical research, kind of like the setup of why we're there. And it was really cool to be part of something and watch it, you know, to, because what people don't realize is that a brand new television show, like you've got to figure out what the beats are and stuff. Like, what's it going to look like? How is it going to go? Uh, something that's episodic has to feel familiar, but but unique in its own thing. And so it was really cool to be part of that. And then it aired and I'm like, well, that was fun. On to the next project. And then the Travel Channel called and said, hey, we have a hit. How fast can we get back to work? And we all said, I guess tomorrow. And uh, that was our last day off was 2008, I believe. Oh, and then COVID. Thank you, COVID, oh, for, for a little oh, bit of little for a few few weeks off. But that's about it. But that's about it. So how is it again? That's 14 years ish, 25 ish seasons. I can't even keep count. Is it hard to keep that fresh? I mean, because you have it, it changes off with the one kind of theme and it's haunted things. How creative do you have to get in thinking of of places and plot lines so you know I, i've been doing this 25 years now um writing about the paranormal publishing about it and i have a really good friend that i went to college with who's a sports writer and i remember having a conversation with him about like how many ways can you write about a football game i mean there's going to be turnovers and fumbles and one team's going to win and one team's going to lose and it's going to be a couple of exciting plays but hasn't it all happened at some point and you've written it and he goes well, that's the challenge of of working in, you know, one specific area of interest. And then I was like, oh, wait, that's what I do, too. <laughs> you know, and so so, <laughs> you know, you look at every every building, every haunt is unique. And yeah. when you when you approach a, a new story like that, um, I, I remember early in the early in the seasons, like way back when 
uh, we were doing a place called, um, um, oh God, Penhurst, Penhurst Asylum, right outside of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, an abandoned asylum. I know what to do. This is like all the others. And then I started to dig into it and realized, no, it's not. Um, and, and I've never made that mistake since Penhurst taught me a val valuable lesson that while there are similarities where, you know, they got overcrowded, they got underfunded, um, you can't paint any haunt with the same brush. You know, everyone is a unique place with unique people that came and went. And, uh, and when you realize that it's actually quite comforting because you'll never run out of stories ever, right. That will never, there will never right. be all of them. Um, so when you, when I, from my perspective, I'm always looking like, what's a new angle we can take on this haunt? What's something we haven't looked at before? Whether it's uh, the history of the land or uh, a side avenue on, on one of the people who may have had something going on with them, or, or can we bring in a psychic medium like yourself, Patty? You know, like what, what can we do yeah. to, to serve this story, which is different than every other one we've ever done? Uh, and that's that's the challenge of it. And that's sort of like, that's fun after all these years to, I, I look at each one like, okay, this is the first one. Let's do it. That's awesome. Awesome. And you do it very well. Again, it keeps going. So that means you're doing something right. You know um, what it is too, though? I think like it's such a team of people and we all know what to expect of each other. Um, and so that helps a lot. You know, we, we've we've sort of kind of got it down. I know what Zach needs. Um, I know what the, the producers need. And uh, it's just been a it's a really great team to work with. And And all of us are just amazed. Like, wow, 14 years and still going. Yeah. Well, that's what I've noticed on episodes I've done. I come from a background of like um, kamikaze theater, like small theater where everybody does everything and you're a team player and it's this and that. And and that's what I come from. And so with Curse Walking Onto Your Show, even a well-established by that time show, it's Aaron, pick up that light. You do the, it's like, oh, everybody, oh, it's a team. It's a real team. Not like so many like episodic shows and dramatic shows. I don't touch that. I touch the plastic pieces, not the pauper pieces. Like, okay, you know, can you fix my button? No, okay. You know, it's it's a whole different world. And it reminds me of of my, the goofy world I kind of came up in. And and that's kudos on that. Yeah, it's it's been a it's been a really great adventure. It's only weird, like when I I'm giving a talk somewhere and some younger person will be like, I've been watching Ghost Adventures since I was a kid. <laughs> and I'm like since before I was born right I, did, I was like oh man that I'm suddenly I feel old but uh it's been great yeah and it's allowed me to do so many other great projects you know what I mean like so you know Ghost Adventures allows me to continue to write books and it allows me to do my own podcast and um all the other great projects that I do and um I'm, at any given time I'm juggling five or six things in the air um but I I couldn't live any other way at this point yeah I get that so how did you become that getting be before Ghost Adventures, how did you become this author, historian, and very much about the paranormal? How did you even get there? Was it experiences guess, you had? or I didn't have a lot of experiences as a kid, but I grew up in Sandy Hook, Connecticut, which is uh, the town next to Monroe, Connecticut. And when I was probably 13, I first met Ed and Lorraine Warren. And mm. they lived in that, you know, they were, they're Monroe people. And so um, I would attend their, their library lectures. Back then, by the way, they were way less famous than they are now posthumously because of the movies. Back then, they were just local celebrities. Um, in fact, as a kid, I remember there was a place called Superstar Sports. Don't look it up. It's long gone. But it was on Main Street in Newtown. And uh, people be like, oh, that building's really haunted. And you go, oh, come on, really? And they go, no, no, Ed and Lorraine Warren checked it out. And like that's that was the end of the discussion, right? That was the mic yeah. drop. Ed and Lorraine Warren looked at it, so it's haunted. And so, uh, you know, so back then I would watch their their programs. Lorraine went to our church. You'd see them in the grocery store. And I thought, wow, what a cool job to like look for ghosts in haunted places. And I had a buddy who lived down the street in a house that was built in like 1760. And his house was haunted. And it was so matter of fact. It was not like, oh, there's blood dripping out of the walls or anything like that. It was just someone else lives here with us. And please don't tell your parents. They'll think we're crazy. And so I was like, wow, you know, and so I, I sort of grew up in, a, in an old New England town where it was sort of normalized. Like it wasn't something that was hushed. It was just like that building's haunted. That one isn't whatever. You know, what time's lunch? And uh, and so as I got older, and I wanted to be a writer and working for newspapers and magazines around October. You go looking for ghost stories. And that's how it all started. I mean, I, I would do these feature stories. And then I, I started my website, Ghost Village, in 1999 
which is crazy because that was 23 wow. years ago. And then, uh, you know, and then I started writing books and then Zach called. And one day you, I sort of woke up and I went, oh, my gosh, this is my full time job. I look for ghosts and, and monsters and weird stories all the time. That's that's my job now. And it's I'm, I'm, I love it. I'm blessed. If it ended tomorrow, I'll be forever grateful. Yeah. And it's not just that's your job. You are like the top of the pyramid, dude, as far as respect and experience and who you would go to for this kind of stuff. So that's that's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's it's you know, I think what it is is like I I, uh, I I you have to love it because it doesn't pay very well. And, you know, and and, uh, and and it takes up a lot of time and some people will call you names and say bad things about you on the Internet just because of the stuff that you look into, even though I really I mean, I. I I would never preach anything. You know what I mean? I don't tell you, you have to believe in ghosts. I don't care if you don't, it's okay. Um, I'm more about the discussion. Like how can we discuss this subject? Because it relates to much bigger issues like life and death and dying and what happens after we die. And uh, it allows us to have that, that sort of dialogue. Uh, and it's a dialogue we should have because, you know, I hate to break it to everyone, but we're all going to die one day. Right. Scary, right. Right. I know. We are. Um, I know. So what? Uh, yeah. And I'm like you, too. I don't I don't care what people believe or if they even believe me. You know, you just be respectful out there when we're doing stuff together or that's when yeah. trouble happens. But why do you think um, I have my thoughts on it that the paranormal is, is not going away? It's getting bigger and bigger. It's not like it's a little fad that came in like this kind of show or that kind of show. Um do you think it is that big what's going on in life? We need to know there's something more. That's what I think. So if you don't want to go back to church or you don't want to get a, a spirituality, it's like, let's go, go be a paranormal investigator. Yeah. So you um, if you look back historically, uh, starting with the spiritualist movement in 1848 with the Fox sisters um, and, and the spiritualist movement is so closely tied to ghost hunting and paranormal. Uh, that's that's the that's the the flower that grew into. I mean, obviously there was stuff before that. There was you know people doing weird things before, but that's a line in the sand historically, because they were the you know the Sylvia Browns and James Van Proggs and the the Patty Negris of their day, right? Like they they took it on the road and said doing mediumship. And I really believe that spiritualism, the idea that you go to a person to talk to a spirit, someone who's passed on may have died off if not for the U.S. Civil War uh, in the 1860s, because you had really? so many people dying untimely deaths uh, and folks wanted answers. I mean, you know, you go to your minister who says, well, just pray on it. You haven't heard from your husband or your son or your brother or, or your cousin or your neighbor in months. And is he alive? Is he dead? You know, like I need closure. I need something. And your minister, your rabbi, whoever you, your religious leader was, was just like, ah, you know, God's will and all that. And it wasn't enough. So people went to mediums. Some of those mediums were full of it. Right. And um, mm -hmm. they'd be like, oh, yeah. yes, your husband's dead, but in a better place. And he's happy. And then a week later, he stumbles home like I couldn't get a letter out to you. Um, but yeah. from from there, you have things like talking boards, spirit boards, Ouija boards, you know, which became an actual product in 1891. And then you've got, um, you know, all these devices and all this idea, psychical research was born from the spiritualist movement. Psychical research is the precursor to ghost hunting. And mm -hmm. so whenever there's turmoil in the world, uh, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, like interest in this stuff really spikes. It never goes to zero. It's never nothing, but it spikes. Uh, Ouija board sales go up. Psychic mediums get contacted more. Since really, I mean, I think the next line in the sand we can point to is 9-11. We've been in a, a spiral of turmoil, you know, like not constant, but of course things have been rough and we're bombarded yeah. with so much information that I think we kind of want to turn back to something primal, right? Something inside of us that's not fed to us, the answers we seek for ourselves and I think that's why the subject's gotten so, so popular since 2001, 2004, when ghost hunters went on, you know, went on the air and, and really started to normalize ghost hunting. Uh, and from there you have, you know, 787 other paranormal investigation shows <laughs> uh, that have been born. Some have come and gone and some are still around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I started my own little mini network. That's all Paraflix. It's all paranormal. It's, it's crazy. And we're just doing great. It's, people want it so and you just I, I believe the exact same thing you just stated it's so much better 
Um, I want to congratulate you on the Shock Doc show. I watch. I don't watch much TV. Don't tell anybody. But I find I watched your new Shock Docs show last night, and it was an alien one. You are brilliant on that on air in front of the camera. I mean, I know you have your other show, but this was a, a way I hadn't quite seen you yet. So tell us about that. Yeah, so the latest Shock Doc, I've done seven of them now, and that was the sixth one that's aired. Um, that one was about uh, Whitley Strieber's 1985 uh, alien abduction in upstate New York. And, I mean, I'm interested in all weird things, but certainly ghosts have been more my wheelhouse. But they called me, and I said, you know, I've had a UFO experience. I wasn't abducted or anything. I just saw one with my dad. Um, and I lived not too far from where uh, a lot where Whitley was, you know— had that experience. And so, um, and I read communion when I was much younger, communion was the book that Whitley wrote about his abduction. And I remember being scared to death. The idea that, uh, you know, ghosts are one thing, you know, you're someplace and you see something and you go, Whoa, what was that? And it's profound, but, uh, aliens are, are much more literal, right? They're, they're right there. And the idea that you could be abducted by someone who's far superior to you with technology or whatever is really frightening. And so uh, it was a story that I was I was psyched to dig into and then go to get to go to Whitley's cabin where he's built a stone circle for him, for Whitley. And it, and it wasn't just an alien experience. It was very much like and by the way, I'm using the word alien. Forgive me. He calls them visitors because he's he's very clear that he does not know where they're from. Right. Uh, they could be from a dimension nearby. They could be f us from the future. Um, he, he does not draw a conclusion, which I always respected him for. Cause he's, I don't know. I, they didn't say I come from this planet or whatever, like this, they're just there. And so, uh, to be at his cabin, to be at the stone circle and, and get to really dig into the story was amazing. And, and Whitley was, you know, he told his own story so very well. Um, and, and I get it. Some people are not going to believe him. We're used to that. You know, anytime you make a, a bold claim, I saw a ghost, I saw an alien or whatever. There are going to be people that say, I don't believe in that. Therefore, you're lying, which is rough on people that have had the experience because it's not fair. It's like saying, I've never swam in the Indian Ocean. Therefore, it doesn't exist. And you say, there's like a billion plus people that live around the Indian Ocean, you know, billion. Uh, and they've swam in it and they know it and they see it every day. But they're liars because you haven't seen it. I mean, it's a very egotistical worldview, right? An, an egocentric way to look at the world is to say, if it doesn't fall into my belief system or life experience, then it can't be real. Um, but Whitley is genuine. His story hasn't really varied over the last, oh God, 40 years, right? Um, wow. And so uh, so it was cool to be part of that. And and it was a good production company. And and I really liked the producer. And um, I, I liked the way it came out. I thought it was, it was uh, really neat to be there and to include Whitley and, and everything. So yeah, no, I it, I loved it. I, I you know I like you had your adventure spirit into it, your expert spirit into it. It was all really good. Um, so we have Halloween coming up. Um, we are into October now. We're getting there very closely. So what do you have planned for Halloween? What is your thoughts on Halloween, which is I think has become the like most popular holiday for almost everybody that I know of. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing. It, Halloween is now the second largest consumer holiday behind Christmas in the United States. Um, but my friends, don't be satisfied with number two. If we keep at it, right, we can overtake. <laughs> um, uh, it's funny, though. It's it's uh, always been a favorite holiday of mine ever since I was a kid. And now every fall I do a, a speaking tour where I'll go out and on, on stages, libraries, colleges and things like that. And share these stories in person, which, by the way, is my favorite thing to do, because, like, I don't mm -hmm. get to sit in your living room when you watch Ghost Adventures or when you watch the Shock Docs or whatever, um, or sit in your lap when you read my books. But I get to see your reaction when I share these stories live. And that's why I love, like, Michigan Paracon, you know, to have that that back and forth with an audience is so powerful, because I've always thought these stories are, are this this malleable thing. Right. I mean, I'll give you the facts, but but what they mean to you might be different than what they mean to me. And uh, and so you share these stories of haunts and monsters and things like that. And I let you draw your own conclusions. And it's kind of neat how people can sort of change just a little bit from letting these stories in. And I tell every I always tell my audience is like, here's the thing. Every story I've told you today, like based on on the best facts I could find are yours to keep. You know, go there for yourself if you want. Share them with someone else. 
they're they're I don't own them. You know, they're they're all communal property. And I love that. I love that. Uh, I mean, a legend is born because someone experienced something profound, shared it with someone else. That person said, whoa, believed it enough to share it with someone else. And then suddenly we're all talking about this building or this place or this battlefield or this boat or this lake, whatever it may be, uh, years and years later, because something happened and we still want to look into it. We still want to know more. We want to become part of the story. So for me, it's just it's a mad month of, you know, doing media, doing interviews, um, telling, sharing stories. But I have a secret for everybody. And this oh, kind of okay. tells We won't tell my, anybody. Tell us. We won't tell. I'll just tell you. Um, I'm working on a book that's going to come out next year. It's just about finished. And it turns out uh, Halloween is the second biggest consumer holiday. And I know this is going to sound like heresy. Forgive me, please. I beg you. Halloween is also the second most frightening holiday. It's number two. It's not number one. Really? What's and, the most and, frightening and it's, holiday? It's going to get worse. It's a distant second. It's not even close. It's not even a contest. How could that? Okay, what? what is the scariest holiday? Christmas. And I'm, it's not a joke. It's not a joke. So uh, in Halloween, the veil between the world of the living and world of the dead is at its thinnest. Ghosts can come into our world. And I get ghosts scare some people. You might be afraid, absolutely. But ghosts in general don't hurt people. Yeah. Yule, Saturnalia, uh, Christmas, the, the, the midwinter, there are monsters, lethal monsters that come down from the mountains, take your children back to their lair, cut them into pieces, cook them in a stew and eat them. You could die at Christmas from these horrible, horrible monsters that are lurking in the cold, dark night where the sun may not come back at all. So if you're afraid of ghosts, I get it. But a monster taking my kid away and eating her like that's worse to me. It's so much more frightening. Uh, and and it's so fun to explore it. You know, you know, Krampus, Belschnickel, Grilla, of course. The cool lads, Cr they're coming for us. And you're worried about Halloween. Run away, that people. That is hysterical. Well, Krampus is making such a comeback. I know everybody, whether that's media that makes it happen, but you just gave away all our witchy craft pagan secrets. Don't tell. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, Krampus, it's funny. Krampus, I get it. He's sexy. He's, he's, he's media friendly. Everybody loves Krampus. He's not the most frightening at all, but by, by far, because sometimes Krampus is just the Punisher, you know, the, the cohort to St. Nicholas. But I mean, Hans Trapp, which hails from like the border of France and Germany, that's the Christmas cannibal scarecrow. Like, God, he dresses as a scarecrow to try to lure children in and then kills them. Wow. Please. I missed that completely. I know we grew up in the uh, wrong country. That's we all we it. did. Yeah. Um, that is yeah, that is wild. Because again, I celebrate Yule. I celebrate Saturnalia. I all these. That's that is my belief system. And Patty, you know who else does? Me, like almost who? everybody, right? Right. When you put a wreath on your front door, it's not. It's not like oh, Jesus in the Bible, like hung a wreath over the manger. There's no wreath. Yeah. There's no evergreen. Yeah, you, that's Yule. Right. And that's OK. I'm not saying like I'm not calling anybody out. If you want to venerate no. it and make it about the birth of, of, you know, your religion, have at it. Don't stop. It's yeah. all good. But just recognize yeah, I, that it's its roots are, are steeped in a tradition of coming together, uh, misrule, sharing drinks and wine and singing songs and giving gifts and turning society on its ear because we're going to settle in for the long, dark, cold, frightening winter and we're going to need each other to get through it. Yeah, that's the pagan wheel of the year. Just like, yeah, and again, they borrowed from all our things, like Easter. The, the Jesus is, has nothing to do with bunnies and eggs. That's going back to the pagan Ostara. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the goddess Esther, share. right? And so, and yeah. I and I love when people are like, you know, think about the bunny and the egg, and I'm like, do you realize what you're doing is teaching your kids about <laughs> fertility? Right, which is good. Like I get it. It's a nice, safe way to do it. I'm I'm totally on board, but that's really what it comes from. It's just like, you know, the bunny and bunny is the most prolific, right? Breeder. And then the egg represents the, the new life and it's spring and all that stuff. It's all good, but uh, but it's uh, it's been adopted. And and I love when you sort of pick apart how we got to here because that's what I do like with a haunting, right? You say, why is this building haunted? The only way to answer that is to go back in time and sort of backfill who lived here, who built this place, who died here, what events took place 
that would lead to that. And so everything has a backstory. Easter has a backstory. Christmas has a backstory. Halloween has a backstory. Halloween, right? Total American invention uh, during the, the Depression and, and kids are getting unruly. So we invent trick or treat. Uh, based on really old, old ways. Samhain, of course. You know? Samhain. And, it's, yeah. you, didn't you put on the masks to not scare the ghosts because the veil is thin and the bad ghosts? And they would cut out. They didn't have pumpkins. Didn't they have like turnips or something turnips, yeah. across the pond to, to, to scare away the bad spirits? Yeah. We yeah, it's, it's it. so, so many great stories, you know. Um, yeah, the, the, the turnip, the, the jack-o'-lantern was my favorite, you know. It, it got Christianized where, where Jack scared a, the devil up into a tree one day and carved a cross in the base of the tree and told the devil, you know, stop tormenting me, stop following me around, you're, you're, you're ruining my life. And so the devil's trapped, and so he strikes a deal with Jack and says, if you let me out of the tree, I'll leave you alone for all of eternity. And so Jack agrees, and the devil comes out of the tree, and they go out their merry ways. But when Jack dies, he can't go to heaven because he's a bad guy, and he can't go to hell because of his deal with the devil. And the devil, they say, took pity on Jack, and gave him, gave him a glowing ember from hell to light his way through eternal darkness. And Jack carved up a turnip and put that ember inside, and it became the Jack O'Lantern. And when the Irish came over here to America, there were not many turnips, but there were plenty of pumpkins. And we've sort of continued that tradition ever since. I did not know that story. That is brilliant, the Jack O'Lantern. Ah, wow, that is so great. Um, oh, I could talk to you for days and days and days, but I can't talk to you for days and days and days. So tell anybody um, what you can have coming up that they can see you on, watch you on, read you on, view you on, listen to you on, and how they can find you. Yeah, thanks. No, I, I, I mean, I'm on Discovery Plus for the Shock Docs, if you're into those uh, those stories. And I love the Shock Docs because it's a lot more in depth than like a, a ghost hunting show. It's just it's like it's all about story and the history and the eyewitnesses. So I think they've been doing a great job with those, uh, even the ones I'm not a part of. Um, but uh, those are on Discovery Plus. Uh, I have a show called New England Legends. You can watch on Amazon Prime. And it's also a weekly podcast. If you like weird stories, those are wherever you get your podcasts. And then my website, which is just my name, jeffbelanger.com. Uh, you can find out everywhere that I'll be. Um, I'm doing, sometimes there are online programs where you can tune in from anywhere. A lot of them are in person. And uh, I'm just grateful that I get to share these stories with people and that I get to connect with awesome folks and uh, you know, be part of this community that's so weird and wonderful. Uh, and, and I don't know about you, Patty, but like when I go anywhere else, uh, like where there's muggles, <laughs> I don't fit in at all. <laughs> I don't either. Feel right. <laughs> I I tried for so long, Jeff. I ran a production. Ca I tried for so long, and it just didn't. And the muggles. It's like muggles. We had to find our little world of weird people who are yeah. so much nicer as a rule. <laughs> yeah, we we had no, we, like we had a, like a neighborhood block party. I'm like, I should go, you know. And, and you're just sort of hanging out, and I'm just like. I don't know. I got nothing to say to anybody. And I'm being rude. I'm just like, I don't know what to do. I'm literally at lost. And then I go to Michigan Paracon and I'm like, ah, my people, right? This is, these are my people. And, uh, and it's, we can always find something weird to talk about, which is just so much more fun for me to connect. So thank you fellow weirdo for, uh, for connecting. Yes. Yes. So you guys, Best storyteller ever. Check him out, jeffbelanger.com. He has lots of beautiful books from weird Massachusetts to our haunted life, things, nightmares. Oh, I, we didn't get to talk about that. Nightmare Encyclopedia. Yeah. I've got so many copies of dream manual, you know, dream books and dream, but it's like, you have a nightmare one. How, how cool is that? <laughs> yeah, so that was a weird project. Sometimes projects fall out of the sky. And it was years ago, my publisher had called me and said, uh, we hired an author to write this book about nightmares and he t he just vanished and will you do it and i was like yes yes i will and uh, the thing about and i know that sounds weird to some people but when you're a writer and researcher like i don't know i could be if as long as i have an interest in it i could become expert at just about anything you know you just start to learn and you go well let's dig in yeah and and so that was nightmares and i got way into like carl jung and dream theory and and all that other stuff and so uh, you know we dream every night, even if you don't remember it, but the nightmares are the ones you do remember. And I always feel like if nothing else, a dream at its most base level is you communicating with you. And so a dream is a message, any dream. And if you keep a journal of it or whatever, you can start to decipher those messages from you to you. A nightmare is a message you're just not getting. 
It's an important message. And and the, the dream is always metaphor. It would be wonderful if our dreams could say, you know, Jeff, you've been eating way too much sugar lately. Maybe cut that back a little, you know, but it doesn't work that way. You, you get chased by a monster no. in a grocery store and you try to figure that out. So I, I love the way that um, we can interpret uh, dreams to, to live a better life, our own dreams. Because if a yeah. message is coming from you, from within, like what's a more important message than that? You know, nothing. Right. Like that's Nothing. that's you communicating with you. And so it was so fun to uh, do this. And I, I've given um, I did like a radio tour where I would interpret people's dreams. And I don't. And when I say interpret, I help you interpret them. You know, there's certain imagery that comes up fire and water and, and you know, houses and teeth falling out. There's certain themes that come up again and again. Uh, but, you know, if I'm a marine biologist, a water dream may be different for me than it is for you. Right. If I'm a firefighter. I might dream about fire differently than you do. So you got to kind of fit it in the nuances. But when you de decipher your own dreams, it's it's amazing what you can learn about yourself and what's going on in your own space and time, um, you know, because of that. So I'm just become a big advocate of uh, dream work because I think like we can learn so much about ourselves and become better people. I, I agree wholeheartedly. I need to get that one. So um, you guys check him out. You guys are going to love my friend, my, Jeff Belanger. So thank you so much for bringing your magic to the witching hour. Thanks, Patty. Bye-bye. Ah,